What's happening, Z Pack? It's your boy, Z Dog MD. I am live and direct from the road. It's Incident Report Mobile. This is Saturday, October 14th, the day after October 13th, which would be Friday the 13th. And I gave a talk on Friday the 13th, and no one died. Almost no one. It was like a Jason thing. Anyways, I want to first, before we dive into the matter at hand, and the matter at hand is Dr. Peter Galligley in Gainesville, Florida, urgent care doc, news thing, viral clip, yelling at a patient, get the F out of my clinic, takes the kid's phone, oh my gosh, worst doctor ever, never, oh my, uh, why? Wrong, wrong. I'm gonna tell you in this podcast why everyone in the ZPAC and everyone in healthcare should be standing up for Dr. Peter Galligley, not for his actions, which were clearly unprofessional, he lost his temper, he snapped. But for the fact that he was protecting his staff, was provoked by outrageous, ridiculous behavior from patients, which we see all the time and which is tolerated by administration, by everybody, by all of us. It's tolerated and therefore encouraged. And if we don't stand up now to this BS, it's just gonna keep happening and happening and happening. And that hashtag, silent no more, it's not just a damn hashtag, right? We need to actually live it. Now, when I first talked about this story, it was a little earlier. We didn't have all the information. We saw the video and my reaction to the video was I felt emotional about it because I could see both sides of the thing, not knowing any of the backstory. Clearly, he had been pushed to snap. Clearly, the patient was behaving you know, very submissively at that point. And I thought, well, what's going on here? Now, more information has come out. We hear his story and it resonates deeply with those of us in healthcare because many of us live it every single day. We get abused on all sides, we get profanities yelled at us, we get threatened with physical violence, and then we have a very human reaction, very rarely, which is to snap and behave somewhat unprofessionally. Although, secretly many of us are like, hell yeah, exactly what I would have done, even though we probably wouldn't have because we, we you know, we didn't, we didn't snap and we are trained to be professionals and we should be professionals and we should be held to a higher standard. Anyways, before we get into all that, I want to again mention that this is physician and nurse and clinician burnout week, uh, burnout month sponsored by our, um, our uh, sponsor this month, Athena Health. And I have to say, we don't just let anybody sponsor the show. They are a big health IT company. They make an electronic health record. They also do a lot of big data analytics. They build networks. The reason we work with them is they actually give a damn about physician burnout, clinician burnout. They care about it, they study it, and they just released survey results from a year-long survey about what they call physician capability. So do physicians feel like they're supported, that they have the autonomy and the latitude to take care of patients? Do they feel like they have the resources? And the answers are unsurprising. When they don't feel capable to take care of patients by those definitions, they are more likely to be burned out, more likely to wanna to leave their job soon. Their organizations are less successful. And so the fact that Athena Health is studying this <clears throat> and trying to make their software such that it reduces busy work, helps enable patient care, and then gets out of the way so doctors are spending less time doing administration and busy work and they free up to actually spend more time actually doing this, taking care of patients as healers. So thank you to Athena for supporting us. All right, now back into the fray. <clears throat> I'm on the road, I'm, in, I'm at the, the Gaylord Resort in Florida. I'm gonna get back to that later, but I wanna get into this. Dr. Peter Galligley, who's a family medicine trained, also trained, boarded in addiction medicine, works in Florida. Um, his bio was taken down off the website, but um, they had a version of it on some news article that I read. And this video came out that a patient had taken who was waiting like <clears throat> what they thought was too long, an hour. And um, the video is him coming out. And maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we'll watch it right now again because I think it's good to remind ourselves when you get your shitty first draft, when you see a video, what are your thoughts? And it's funny, when I showed this video the other day and I gave you my first draft, a lot of people already were like, now, mm -mm, that patient is bad news, I can tell you already. And um, <clears throat> I was looking at both sides and trying to have a nuanced discussion. Now, let's watch this video again so that we can get a sense of what we're talking about. Okay, hang tight with me. All right. 
Let's see if we can make this work. Are you kidding me? Do you know how many people? I've got seven rooms okay. back there. I made an appointment at 630 because I knew that he got my bed an hour and 45 minutes. We've and already I've been working on you. We've you done a urine test on you. I've nope, seen you. You came in and said, I'm going to check your pee. I'm Does that take three me. seconds, you think? I don't know how long Do you want to be seen or not? I want to go home and get in my bed. I'm then fine. Get the hell out. Get your money and get the hell out. I did. But that See you later. Is just rude. Really? Just really? If you go to care spot, you're waiting for three hours. I don't know go to the ER and wait for nine hours. I don't know. Okay, you can get, get out of her face. Fuck out of my office. I will now. complain with a better business. Mom, I got it on video, so it doesn't matter. And a, go. And my What's your daughter? This. My What's your name? Recording. You're recording. Give me my phone. I'm calling my mom. I'm calling him early. He's gonna get hit. I'm calling. Give me my phone. I'm calling the police. Wow. All right, now let's go with um, <clears throat> shitty first draft on that. You're a patient advocate, you care about patients, you only see that. What do you see? You see a doctor losing his shit on somebody who's behaving not terribly, who's just calmly responding, and whose daughter happens to be filming it. And you're thinking you're seeing, you know, one of these, uh, you know, police brutality videos or something, and you know, you 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 get one half of the story, and you don't get the lead up, you don't get the context. Well, what happens when you get the lead up and the context? It turns out that this patient and her daughter were verbally belligerent, that they were threatening physical violence to the staff, that the daughter said, "I'm going to bring my big black dad in here and kick all y'all's asses," according to the police report and witness accounts, which have now been released. And <clears throat> when you start to see this, what you realize is that in healthcare, we go through so much training and so much heartache and so much sacrifice to help other people, and then we get treated like shit, someone videotapes us, and this guy's in trouble now. Dr. Ga Gallagher's in trouble, a guy who by every account that I have heard, including Google reviews prior to this incident, which are always bad for doctors, which were good for him, his colleagues and coworkers have messaged me, said he's an absolutely good, upstanding human being and a great doctor. And now he's in the national news because of this interaction. Now let's read, because what really tipped it for me was reading his letter response. He did something that is rarely done in medicine. First of all, he took responsibility and he apologized for his behavior, but he also gave the necessary background for us to understand what was actually happening. Let me read some of this to you so that you guys who haven't read it yet, and I posted it earlier today on Facebook, can, can understand what's going on. He says, regarding the incident that occurred on the evening of Monday, October 9th, at the Gainesville After Hour Clinics between the staff and Jessica Stipe, that's the mother shown in the video, and her daughter, Courtney Weirin, uh, please find the attached police report and witness statements. Okay, so he gives you these witness statements and police report, which I encourage you to read directly. <clears throat> Ms. Type had been increasingly belligerent and was abusive to the office staff, cursing them, threatening them with violence because she was unwell and had been waiting to be seen by me for more than an hour. Ms. Type demanded her co-payment co be returned such that she could be discharged and seek medical treatment elsewhere. All her payments were returned to her and she, and she was so discharged. I went to the front desk only because after Ms. Stipe received her refund, she refused to leave the office and continued her abusive behavior towards the staff. Despite repeated requests from the office staff, she repeatedly demanded to see me instead of leaving. When I walked into the waiting room, Ms. Stipe and Ms. Warren cursed and threatened me as they had done with the office staff previously. The front desk then called the police. The front desk then called the police, who warned the two that if they returned to the office, it would be a trespass violation. At the very end of events, I most regrettably lost my temper and spoke to the woman in a most unprofessional manner. I make no excuses for my unacceptable behavior. All right, so he's laid that out. He is not saying that he did anything right in yelling at this woman and cursing at her and 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 forcibly kicking her out, or in taking the phone from the daughter, physically taking the phone. 
But please appreciate that the videotape is but the last minute or two of a very abusive tirade against my office staff by the two women. The videotape is very heavily edited and is taken entirely out of a very broad context as attachments demonstrate. The witness statements and police report objectively demonstrate that the office staff and I were merely reacting to unreasonable provocations and threats of physical violence, which is the basis of the police intervention. Again, while this is not an excuse for my behavior, a basic reason for my reaction is that I simply regard my staff as family and I overreacted in order to, the de to defend them. Now, regardless of the context, it's increasingly, it's, it's clearly my responsibility and professional duty to maintain my composure in the presence of patients, notwithstanding even the worst of provocations. I regret losing my temper and speaking to the two women in the manner that is not benefiting a medical doctor. It has never occurred previously with a patient and it most assuredly will not occur again. Peter Galligly, MD. All right, guys. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to tell you, before I take your comments, I'm going to tell you where my elephant is on this, all right? When I first saw the video, I thought, okay, there's a story here that we're not getting back, and I bet you that these patients were actually escalating in a way that caused this doc to snap. But I had, I had trouble really deeply feeling a lot of uh, um, uh, empathy for the physician just because of the clip that you see where he's clearly you know lost it and is yelling at these guys so all you see is that and remember I've talked about empathy empathy is a horrible terrible thing because it shines a spotlight on only one or two things based on limited evidence and then you make dumb decisions well that's what empathy does with this clip there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of people around the country who watch the clip who are not doctors who are not nurses who are not respiratory therapists who are not dietitians who are not frontline care providers who think this is an outrageous abuse of an innocent person who did nothing to provoke it. Now, reading Dr. Gallagher's message, and sure, it's a he said, she said, but then you read the witness accounts of multiple witnesses and the police report, and you start to realize, well, okay, maybe there's a power differential and the patient's being abused by this powerful system. No, that's horseshit. We all know exactly what happened that this patient was abusive, that she was threatening physical violence, that the staff had to call the police on her, and that at the, exactly the right opportune moment, her daughter turns on the camera and mom suddenly is behaving like a saint. And Dr. Gallagher is losing his temper because his staff has been threatened, he's been pushed one click too far. And that, and so my elephant is so effing pissed right now. I don't know about you guys, but I am so pissed that this poor guy is suffering at the hands of public opinion, right? When it ought to be the opposite way. It ought to be the other way. Like those two women, if anything in that report is true, they should both go to jail for threatening physical violence to the staff of a healthcare institution. Now tell me ZPAC if I'm wrong, tell me if I'm flying off the handle. I am in a strange hotel room in a NASA shirt, so not everything is normal with me, but Tell me if I'm crazy. Let's read some comments because I'm pissed off on behalf of this doctor who should have our unwavering support, ZPAC. And I don't always say that. Everything is nuanced always in my world the way I see things. But the, the nuance here is he screwed up and that he lost his temper but he was provoked in a way that many of us are. And the wrong response to this is to just exclusively censure this guy instead of saying, yeah, we recognize the behavior was bad. We also recognize we might've done the same thing if pushed too far. We're not gonna condone the behavior, but we're actually going to very strongly dis disincentivize the kind of behavior the patient showed that led to that behavior and criticize the behavior. And again, it's about the behavior, not the people. Now, Danny Zipkin, who was my big sib in UCSF, uh, she's a great doctor now in North Carolina, internist. She left a really good comment when I posted this article earlier. And she said, yes, empathy, and, and we understand compassion for the doc, but like this is how you handle that situation professionally. And she laid it out. And it's all true, but I think what happened here is one click too far in an abusive system where we are blamed for our own burnout. And you know, <clears throat> I'm not gonna har ha I, I'm not gonna harp on on the fact that this is burnout month for us on the show and that Athena is sponsoring the show. I'm gonna harp on the fact that the fact that we're talking about burnout 
means that we have to talk about it in a way, and this is what Athena does. It's not about, it's not the physician's fault. It's not the nurse's fault. It's not the clinician's fault. It's a systemic environmental squeeze on us that we go in for these reasons and we meet a system that's so just absolutely disabuses us of any notions of doing good in the world. And you wonder why we start to malfunction inside and we take the blame on ourselves when we're emotionally disconnected, when we're cynical, when we're depersonalized, when we feel a low sense of personal accomplishment. And those are the three tiers of burnout. And then you look at Peter doing, you know, losing his temper, a guy who by all accounts is a fantastic professional physician, right? Respected by his peers and his patients from everything we can see. And this is what happens. All right, time to read some comments. Um, frankly, when the powers that be uh, decided they were customers instead of patients, it started the decline. Jamie Gladfelter, I couldn't agree more. Okay, and we're gonna talk about customer services when we wrap this cast up, because I'm back in a hotel and I wanna, I wanna follow up on the uh, Gaylord National um, Maryland hotel story that I, that I did the last time I talked about Dr. Peter Ga uh, Gallagher's case um, a couple nights ago. So. You're so right on, says Tanya Aiken. We professionals are demanded to take it all and smile, but, but no matter what, we have to stop rewarding abusive behavior from patients. <laughs> that behavior needs to be disincentivized. And again, it's not about the woman or her daughter. This is not a personal attack on them. This is an attack on their shitty, shitty, shitty behavior because that behavior should be disincentivized. And who knows where they learned it? It might be that that's how they got things done. It might be how, you know, it's like the person who slips in the, you know, that that shooter in Las Vegas who slips in the Cosmopolitan and then sues. Like that kind of bullshit behavior, right? So it's the same thing here. We have to disincentivize the behavior, which means you need structures and support and culture. And one of the things when, the, when Athena did its article on, on burnout, what they found is that phys physicians, and they were studying docs, docs who felt what they call capable, and again, they defined it as they feel supported, they have resources, they have good leadership, and they have the, the tools to take care of patients the way that they know they need to, and they have autonomy. When those things happen, less burnout, better productivity, better outcomes, hello? So when we see this kind of behavior, that, is a, that has gotta be stopped. There have to be resources in place to put the kibosh on that so that all of us clinicians on the front line can actually do their job and feel capable to do it and supported to do it and not burn out, all right? Let's read some more comments. HCAPS didn't help. No, it didn't, Kim Casillas. But let's not, let's not let the pendulum go the other way. We've all seen examples where patients are mistreated, where they are abused, where inappropriate procedures are done to them for profit. This happens, people. Our American healthcare system is a steaming pile of feces when it comes to actually being patient-centric. We do a lot of stuff to patients, but we don't do stuff for patients. 10% of health actually comes from our healthcare system. The rest are social determinants of health. Are you in a happy marriage? Do you have stable relationships? Do you have friends and support? Are you, do you have good nutrition? Are you educated? Those kind of things, social, social determinants of health and more, are what drive health. But in the US, we spend 18% of our GDP supporting, you know, this 10% impact. And it, it, we are culpable for that because we're part of this matrix unless we step out and go, no, we need to focus on prevention. We need to spend more money on social determinants of health. And we need to be smarter and more value conscious in our, in our healthcare delivery. So it's not just about celebrating healthcare providers and against patients. No, it's about elevating patients by elevating all of us. Um, Let's see. So here's, okay, Keitha Sh uh, Schaeffler. Respect your opinion always. Saw the video earlier. I manage many Facebook groups for a chronic medical condition called cyclic vomiting syndrome. And Keitha, that's a condition we talked about on our show. Uh, the, the cannabis variant of it. Uh, cannabis hyperemesis cyclic vomiting syndrome. Um, and unfortunately, I think this type of behavior will only get worse due to continuing stress on the entire healthcare system. And Keitha, coming from the chronic disease patients, you guys are frustrated because you're treated like criminals in the emergency department. There's a lot of suspicion because of the people who abuse those systems, right? And, and this is the problem. We need to come together and figure out actual solutions for these problems. A lot of stuff, you know, fibromyalgia, we did a show on that. Like, 
a lot of the triggers for that were, were psychosocial, emotional, trauma, and now they have real physical pain. And now the, the healthcare system doesn't know what, how to process this. And so we medicalize everything. We really ought to be looking at the bigger picture. It's very hard to do. So where are we at? Clinicians cannot pour from empty vessels. Health and healing is more than procedures and medications. Rebecca Madison, I agree with you. AKA mental freaking health, proper uh, under self-care. Uh, Courtney Tripp, exactly. Maslow, so basic and so true, Valentina Ariola. This is, we talked about Maslow the other day in our, in our Fifty Shades of Taupe episode. The idea that you have to get your physiologic needs, your emotional needs, your needs for safety, your needs for belonging, your needs for accomplishment, your needs for love, you have to get all those straight before you can actually self-actualize finding your true purpose in this world and universe. So how do we help people do that? The medical system doesn't, that's not what we do, all right? And then you end up with this sort of thing. Um, elevating patients by elevating all of us. Clappy emojis, thank you, uh, Tamara Tomac. I mean, I think that's the bottom line. Like we, it, it can come off when, we, when I have these rants, like I'm anti-patient, that it couldn't be further from the truth. If, we're, if we wanna be patient-centered, we also have to center around us. We have to take care of each other, show compassion to each other, love in the face of our own suffering. When we see this doctor who's clearly suffering now because of this event, right? We can recognize the patient suffering, but we can also recognize the behavior because we've all seen it. We've all seen it in the emergency department, in the hospital, in the clinic. We've all seen it. We did a whole video about violence against healthcare providers, verbal and physical and emotional. And I can't tell you how many messages I've gotten describing people's stories about this, right? But the thing is, if we're not able to actually address all of those things, how can we be patient-centric? If we're encouraging shitty patient behaviors and entitlement and bullshit and age caps and a hotel mentality and the patient is a customer, what happens to that sacred relationship? It ends up damaged by what typically customers do, which is they think they're always right and they aren't in healthcare. They aren't. That's why you come to see us because you can't always be right. So we have to help and we have to do it in a, in a collaborative, interpretive way, not in a paternalistic, shitty way. And yeah, we have a long way to go. This is absolutely true. All right, let's keep <laughs> getting all fired up. Let's keep reading. Um, I've shared the fibromyalgia show with three patients thus far, Patrick Beeman. Thank you, Patrick. That means a lot. Hopefully it helps and doesn't make things worse. Um, Philip Mondahar says, hashtag silent no more. Um, Andy Nelson says, it comes down to people who have poor coping mechanisms and it comes out the fold in a stressful situation such as needing to visit the hospital. They project and deflect all those negative ones I can't remember. Uh, I mean, it's true, it's true, Andy, you're, you're right. That's a component of it. Now, I'm gonna admit my, the time I lost my shit. I've done it a few times, but the most memorable one for me was I was rounding. It was when they tapered back the house staff at Stanford, so I only had an intern. It was me, the attending physician on hospital medicine, the intern. And we had this borderline patient, and she was truly borderline personality, sort of documented all up and down the chart. But the behavior kind of spoke volume. So she was nasty to the staff. She would snarl at us. And this was an affluent woman. This wasn't, you know, somebody who had grown up in poverty, et cetera. Clearly she had had some trauma when she was younger, but so she was nasty, she was mean, she constantly pushed everyone's buttons, and we are freaking human beings, especially when we're burned out. When we're burned out, what happens is we become more cynical, more depersonalized, we are, we're emotionally exhausted. And then this is what happened. She pushed me one click too far on, we were rounding, I was rounding with the intern, and she was a brand new intern. And I walked in the room and she said, she started pointing her finger at me like this and saying something, demanding something ridiculous and yelling at me and questioning my competence and all those other things that, in, it, if you're not a little bit insecure about being a doctor, then you're probably not a human being. So if people push the buttons enough, you will start to feel it because it's a hard job and everybody's innately got an imposter syndrome where they feel like, man, I got, uh, you know, I, I, they should have picked someone else. They, they, the admission letter to med school was supposed to go to someone else. And so we all have a little bit of that. And so admitting that vulnerability is actually impossible to do in a healthcare hierarchical culture where it's militaristic and you don't do that. You just suck it the hell up, right? So I go in the room, she does this, she pushes me. And I remember the moment when I snapped. I could feel my blood pressure rising, my face flushing, hands starting to clench like this. 
And I looked a lot like Dr. Peter Gallagher in that moment, but there was no damn camera, thank God. And I got about this close to her face and my finger was about this close from her nose. And I was like, you don't ever talk to me or my team like that again. And if you talk to the staff like that, I will personally put you in a wheelchair and kick you the hell out of my hospital and you will not be allowed back in here. And I don't even know if that's legal, but that's what I'm gonna do because you are a nasty, nasty, mean lady and I have no joy taking care of you, but I will do it because I have to. And it was hor. I mean, the worst possible thing I could have done. But in that moment, it felt incredible. It felt so good. And I imagine that maybe Peter felt that way for a second until he realized what had happened. And I was just like, yes! It was like the dark side just unleashed and everything that had been pent up came out. And here's what happened. So first of all, my intern turned to me and looked at me and was just like, like had this look of horror and the patient who had been so belligerent and so um, so forward and so fearless in her criticism of everybody shrunk back like she'd been hit. And obviously she hadn't been hit and just, just looked at me with this wide-eyed fear. And I remember at that point, it, it, it took a few minutes for me to register what had happened. Like here was a woman who was clearly traumatized at some point in her life, had, had developed this personality disorder, had realized that this is how she has to behave to get anything done, and had never actually had the push back from an authority figure in a way that I did it, in that un, very unprofessional and aggressive way that I did it. And it was terrifying to her because it probably triggered all the memories or whatever previous you know, power asymmetry there was in her life. And I went back an hour later after I cooled down and I remember sitting at her bedside and, uh, and I was like holding her hand and I told her, I, was, I said, I, I'm really sorry for what I did. Um, I, wish I, said, I wish I could say I didn't mean some of those things, but I felt them at the time and I'm so sorry. Sometimes we feel really bad too when we're yelled at and screamed at and felt to feel like we're not competent. And you know what happened? Like from that minute on, we had the best therapeutic relationship. And she was, she was still tough with the nurses and stuff, but better. And she was very good to me and my intern. And we spoke frankly and we got things done and she got discharged safely. And what it took, I think, was the, the ability to come back and say, you're sorry, but, you're sorry, but, the behavior was the problem and it hurts us and this is why and I'm sorry that I lost my professional cool. And in a way, that's exactly what Dr. Gallagher is doing in this, in this letter. And I think that, I'm just realizing now that that's probably why it resonated with me so deeply when I read it today and I just said this, this. So, I'm gonna read some comments and then I'm gonna take you on a tour of my hotel room and I'm gonna tell you about customer service. <laughs> oh my gosh, it gets real up in here, Z-Pack. Um, you had to snap her out of it, Cynthia Primavera. Yes, but I regret that it caused me to snap because I, we're, we're, we're really supposed to be better than that, but we are human beings. And I, what I don't regret is how everything went down because in the end, we formed that relationship that it took going through that period, that, that, that conflagration to make it happen. I'm not recommending you do that. I'm just saying we're all damn humans, right? Um, I had a borderline patient tell me once that violence was all she ever knew as, as a child, so that was the only way she knew how to accomplish anything, Ruthie Arwood, absolutely. Borderline, guys, I want you to understand something. Borderline personality disorder is one of the most painful disorders for us to deal with as clinicians because there's splitting behavior, there's the good guy, bad guy, the hot and cold, but it is absolutely one of the most devastating forms of suffering for the patient who often has little insight but just feels suffering and pain and rages outward like that. And they cannot help it and it's due to whatever happened in childhood and some genetics. And so it's a deep kind of suffering. And if we're talking about not empathy, feeling other people's pain, if we're talking about compassion, which is giving love and concern in the face of human suffering, then we have to accept that borderline is a kind of deep suffering. 
and approach it from a place of compassion and not make it about us because the tendency is to make it about us. And that's what I did that day. I made it about me. And then I had a talk with my intern and I said, let me, let me explain to you why, why that all went down. And she was actually very understanding. She, I know many ways, I think she might've been a psych intern. She actually kind of calmed me down. So that being said, um, there's only so much one person can take, though, says Nazim uh, Maz Mazlagani. Uh, and we take so much abuse, docs, nurse practitioners, nurses, etc. I mean, it is true. Borderlines are very manipulative also, Donna Speed, exactly. And when you feel like you've been manipulated, it's not a good transference to feel. Um, please do a show about borderline personality disorder, Brittany Dennis. We will. Stay tuned. Um, all right, now. And patients need to know their boundaries. In this day and age, people have no boundaries or rules anymore, Nancy Ford. I agree. All right, now, the second piece, we talked about the thing that kind of triggered this was this idea of customer service. Are patients customers? Is a hospital a hotel? Answer is no and no. Patients are patients. They're human beings. They are our partners in helping them make get or make, make a, help a, helping us get them better. They are deep partners in that, but also they give a piece of themselves to us. They help us grow. So it is a partnership. That is very different than a freaking customer at a hotel. And the last show I did about um, customer service was about the Gaylord National Harbor in uh, Maryland and the kind of customer service that I um, that I got there. And I, Gaylord National tweeted at me and wanted to connect about it. And they actually have taken steps to try to make it right. And I didn't want to get anyone in trouble who took care of me there because they were doing their job and they're probably reading off scripts and stuff. But the general vibe I got is that those staff weren't happy and therefore they weren't they weren't translating that into an experience for guests. And other people I talked to who were staying at the hotel felt the same way. Now, I mentioned before that I'm a Marriott's reward member and that was a Marriott property. Well, now I'm staying in another Gaylord Hotel here in Orlando where I am speaking for the National Community Pharmacy Association tomorrow. And this is the Gaylord Orlando something or other. And again, Marriott property, night and day. Beautiful, gleaming facility, just like uh, National Harbor. But everybody from the front desk to the person who delivered my room service, which I'm going to show you right now, um, was absolutely warm. And you could tell there was some scripting, but they would deviate off script. And the woman who I ordered the room service from was laughing because I'd ordered so much food. And I said, yeah, and I'm going to get the beet salad too and the 12 chicken wings and the pizza because I'm a pig. And she giggled and she said, oh, no, you're probably just a you know guy. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. I'm a guy who's traveling without my family and I'm gonna eat some damn chicken wings. So she took a second to connect with me. The food was delivered perfectly. The Haitian gentleman who delivered it had a, such a wonderful French accent and we were talking about Haiti and that is a customer experience. That is feeling listened to, that is connected. And that is what the Gaylord in Orlando did and what the Gaylord in National Harbor failed that time. Now, I don't know. I had two bad experiences there. It doesn't mean that the third would be bad. So go there. Check it out. I know you'll be there for conferences and stuff, CPAC, and give them the benefit of the doubt and help them get better. So that being said, let's do the tour of the hotel, shall we? They got me a cool suite. So there's the bed and uh, a little TV. I don't know what's in these drawers, but usually it's gross. Oh, it's empty and clean. Very nice room, very clean. Come over here and then we'll check out the uh, bathroom. So you've got the usual like hang up the coat for tomorrow thing. There he is, a little tan, you know, because in my mind summer ain't over yet. Come in here and you got the, uh, the bathroom. So just, you know, nothing super special, but nothing bad at all. And then over here, a little bit of bathroom action, nothing too fancy. And then over here, as you walk in, that's the door, the entrance, you've got the full suite. So this is kind of dope. So now I gotta show you what I'm eating or what I ate before the show. And uh, the, only, the only downside here is check out this, uh, this view, it's kind of whack. So this is the view. <laughs> I think everybody else had a view of the beautiful atrium of the facility, but I get a view of the parking lot, which is fine because let me show you something. This is Florida. What is that? That's a mother flipping cow. Look. I didn't even know they, whoa, whoa. I didn't even, whoa, 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 whoa. There we go. I didn't even know they had cows in Florida. WTF. I love it. <laughs> so check it out, check it out, check it out though. Let me show you 
the incredible meal that I had and don't judge. I told you guys when I travel, I eat like crap and I love it, but I only have one meal a day and I tend to walk on the treadmills and do things like that. So I actually come back not gaining weight, but check this out, check this out. So, <laughs> we've got a bunch of pizza crusts because you know me, carbs. <laughs> I'm like, well, I ate most of the crust, but I couldn't, you know, I don't need these excess carbs. Then you come over here, there's a mostly demolished beet salad. So that was my uh, fiber because you know, when you're on the road, you ain't gonna poo unless you eat a salad somewhere. And the beets mean that when you do poo, it's gonna look like hematema, or uh, um, uh, hematokiza, kizia. And that's what's gonna make it dope. They gave me these really cool little fancy unsalted nuts, which I, you know I love those, uh, uh, I love those nuts. And then it came with a little thing of honeycomb. That was courtesy of the conference. And some cheeses and some crackers, which I didn't eat because, you know, carbs. And then I was just, I had enough cheese from the pizza. Let me show you this pizza. Ooh, yeah. Macho man, Randy Savage. I ate half of it, snitches. And then this was, okay, bear with me. This was a 12 piece chicken wing with blue cheese sauce and some butter with some bread. And um, I demolished all but three. So that would be nine chicken wings, half a pizza, and the salad. And that was my one meal of the day. <laughs> I'm gonna die. <laughs> I'm just glad my coronary calcium score was zero. Otherwise, wow. Um, I'm pretty sure, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, Jim Hicks, Florida Cracker is a Florida cowboy who drove cattle with a whip that when, and then it's cut off. Wow, I didn't know that, Florida Cracker. Sounds vaguely racially insensitive. Um, so this is, this is the deal, guys. Uh, I wanna thank, I really wanna thank the Gaylord uh, Resort in Orlando for being so awesome and for delivering such dope food. I wanna thank the National Community Pharmacy Association for having me speak. Tomorrow we are gonna unveil a brand new video celebrating pharmacists around the nation. So stay tuned because it's gonna be live tomorrow and Sunday. I'm gonna, I'm gonna perform it for the first time at the show. And then uh, what else? I wanna thank Athena Health for being dope and supporting a better understanding of physician burnout and trying their best as an EHR vendor, I mean the best an EHR vendor can do, to help us take care of patients without having to do all the busy work. So that being said, I love you, ZPAC. I miss you, ZPAC. And we out. Peace.